you know, one might get the impression being in a desolate place like this that you're all alone, but there's evidence that others have been here before me. There's tire tracks here. So someone's been driving around here. There's some human footprints. I was actually able to find this uh, bullet casing here that's rusted out. So someone's here a long time ago. The best evidence that someone's been here though is the remains of this fire, these coals that are just on the edge of fire. Um, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna talk about what do you leave behind and how useful is it to those who come after you? That's called legacy. You know, legacy happens quite naturally in our family, especially in the physical sense. It's not weird for a child to have their father's nose or their mother's smile or somebody else in the family's dimples or something. Um, it happens physically, it happens in a lot of ways. It happens when family business is passed on or family wealth or family debt can be passed on. Of course, legacy happens in culture as well. We understand the cultural legacy of a guy like Martin Luther King, Abraham Lincoln, uh, somebody religious like Mother Teresa. Uh, also, there's negative uh, legacy that's left in the culture. People like Adolf Hitler and Hugh Hefner. And so legacy is important. If, it, if we pass on physical traits and family businesses and legacies, uh, then maybe it's important for us to discuss the legacy and what we pass on when it comes to church and faith. You know, when we get to the uh, end of the book of Joshua, we find a really, really interesting legacy statement. It's made there in Joshua chapter 24, verse 29. It's the end of his life now, and uh, this is how it re is recorded in the Word of God. After these things, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. Now, that may not mean a whole lot to you yet, but what's really interesting is in Joshua chapter 1, verse 1, the Bible introduces Moses as the servant of the Lord. In fact, all the way through Joshua, Moses and Moses alone 16 times is called the servant of the Lord. But here at Joshua's death, instead of being called the assistant to Moses like he was in verse one, he's called the servant of the Lord. I see this really cool legacy thing going on here. Joshua becomes what Moses was. He carries on this tradition. The thing that's said about Moses, servant of the Lord, has now been passed on to the person that followed in his footsteps. He is the servant of the Lord. And by the way, his legacy is passed on in verse 31. Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua and had known all the work that the Lord did for Israel. We find this really cool legacy thing from Moses to Joshua to the elders, a great legacy of faith. You may be asking yourself, what's the big deal about this uh, legacy of faith? Doesn't it just kind of take care of itself from Moses to Joshua to the elders? Well, the answer is no, uh, because if you just go a few pages past that story in Joshua 24, by Judges chapter 2, verse 10, there's another generation that's risen up. They don't know the Lord and they don't know the things that he's done for the children of Israel. So it's possible that in just one generation, a people of faith can lose their way. And if that's true, then how important is it for us in the church that now in the American church has five generations within one congregation? I want to, I want to just kind of inspire us a little bit today from 2 Timothy. There's a, an obscure verse there, maybe you've passed over it before, in 2 Timothy 1.5 that talks about generational faith. And as Paul writing to his young, young son in the faith, Timothy, he says, I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother Lois, and in your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure dwells in you as well. Uh, Timothy was this great young pastor in Ephesus, but I would contend that his faith and the work that he did as a church, at the church there began in his grandmother uh, many, many years before. And that's what we pray will happen through this whole experience together, that we'll pass on a legacy of faith Every one of us, whether you're one of the original members of Eastview Christian Church that still goes there all these years later, um, or you're just a teenager who thinks, what can I do? What kind of legacy can I lead? Um, actually, everybody coming behind us looks to us for our, our faith. Um, I wanna challenge you to leave a legacy in two ways. Number one, 
um, to live it. If you live out the faith that you have in Jesus Christ, people will see it, it will be real to them. If you're in the family tent right now, um, the best thing you can do for your kids is live out a true faith so they see it every day. If you're a teenager, the best thing you can do is live out a faith so that those who are younger in our church can see you. Um, if you're in your midlife and you're trying to set an example to younger marrieds, the best thing you can do is live out a faith um, that's in the married life and growing kids. Wherever you're at in your life, if you live it, it will be seen by other people. That's the thing about Joshua. Joshua lives, it says, to be 110 years old. He lived out his faith, uh, the same faith over and over and over again for a long period of time and people caught it. The other thing besides living out your faith is being intentional with who you pass it on to. Uh, it's really important for us to, to look at the people around us and go, who are the people that are, that are watching me? Who are the people that I can influence? And hopefully this week you'll be challenged to say, I'm going to take my faith, I'm going to plant it in a future generation, and you'll actually identify who those people are. Let's be the kind of church that leaves a legacy of faith. You know, when it comes to legacy, I'm really not talking about anything super spectacular. I'm talking about thousands of us leaving a burning ember of faith so that the next generation can come along and fan it into flame, a flame that ignites the world for Christ.